Thank you, everyone. And thank you especially to the folks on the phone who are here for the second time around. So um, I'm here today to talk again about uh, Metro Vancouver's experience that, with a project uh, to test emissions, air emissions from heavy-duty trucks um, last year. So before I started off, I will show a short video um, that was produced by Metro Vancouver, our sustainable region television folks, that um, gives you kind of a, 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 moving, um, a, a moving picture of um, what we actually did last year. So I'm just going to try to run this. There are often lineups of trucks leading up to the Nordell truck weigh scale in Delta. Today, Metro Vancouver is testing these lines for something else. We're here today testing emissions from diesel trucks and running this program for the next three months. Metro Vancouver is putting a lot of attention into diesel as its health risks become more apparent. Reducing diesel emissions is our number one priority in terms of air Yeah, sorry, it looks like it's not broadcasting to, to you folks over um, uh, over the internet. It's working fine over here, but um, I'll leave a link in the very last slide if you wanted to watch the video. Um, it's just two and a half minutes, and it uh, um, it's um, kind of nice to see it in action. But I will go ahead <coughs> and proceed with the uh, presentation. So what motivated us to do this um, study? Uh, first of all, I think everyone has um, had some experience with the big rig that passes you and, um, you know, emits a big plume of opaque black smoke and envelops your small car. Um, so I think that perception and, and that sort of memory of what trucks are was a key driver. Um, it certainly was a driver for our uh, politicians who kind of make up our board and, and committees. And they very much wanted us to investigate emissions from this, uh, this source. So in addition to sort of the, percep the perceived um, emissions from vehicles, we do know that diesel uh, trucks emit diesel particulate matter, and that is proven to have health effects. Um, diesel particulate matter, or DPM, is a confirmed carcinogen, and a recent study by Metro Vancouver estimated it to be responsible for two-thirds of the cancer risk associated with air pollution. And finally, diesel soot has been more recently linked to global climate change um, as a short-lived climate forcer. So those are kind of the key motivating reasons uh, behind looking at diesel emissions from trucks. Uh, this uh, slide just kind of illustrates the pathway from the emissions um, that are produced by the vehicle to exposure uh, from a recipient who is sort of exposed to those emissions um, and who receives a dose of diesel PM, uh, which is dependent on both the emissions amount and sort of the proximity to the, to the source. And these result in health effects, as Sad Pumpkin here um, uh, is showing and what we want to do is turn that round upside down by developing policies and actions to reduce those emissions at the source. So a bit of background on how this links to Metro Vancouver's objectives. We have an integrated air quality and greenhouse gas management plan and within it the first strategy is to reduce public exposure to DPM. Um, we have a to support this, we've developed a target to reduce diesel particulate matter by 50% um, from 2005 levels by 2015. The pie chart on the left here shows the sources of DPM in our region in 2010. And as you can see from this pie, um, heavy-duty heavy duty vehicles account for approximately uh, a fifth of the region's diesel particulate matter. So in looking at um, achieving our goal of reducing um, public exposure to DPM, one of the things we found is we didn't have any good real-world emissions data. Um, how does our fleet actually look in our region? The pie chart on the left is actually made out of estimates. It's an estimate of the emissions from all these sources. But what does it actually look like in real life? So to answer that question, we undertook a study last year um, using a technology called Remote Sensing Device, or RSD. Um, and this was a field study to basically collect that real-world real data. Um, as well, we also did a one-week tunnel test, and I'll talk about both of these in a little bit further on. So the objectives of the study were to, first of all, like I mentioned, characterize emissions from diesel vehicles in the lower Fraser Valley. We wanted to understand how these emissions um, came about, uh, how they're emitted um, by the different vehicles in terms of their age, in terms of their weight, um, body styles, and such. We, this RSD technology uses both infrared and ultraviolet 
to collect information on carbon monoxide, VOC, carbon dioxide, um, NO, and opacity, which is a, a measure for particulates. We wanted to collect this information ultimately to look at developing those policy options and using this data to help us design a program to best target the highest emitters. And finally, we wanted to test the feasibility of this technology. It's being used in other parts of the world, um, Colorado, for example, primarily on light duty vehicles, um, as integrated into an actual program um, to screen uh, vehicles similar to, uh, similar to their air care program. Basically, they're using RSD as a way to sort of pre-screen vehicles. And we wanted to get some experience on the ground with this technology in our region and see how it actually works out. Just to note that, so this study, um, it's based, you know, roadside as vehicles pass through. So we captured uh, all sorts of vehicles, not just the heaviest diesel trucks. We um, uh, saw light duty vehicles and, and the whole range of vehicles, anything that passed through basically the equipment. This slide just shows you, you know, sort of the range of vehicles that we were interested in um, and which were captured as part of this, uh, as part of this work. Um, the focus, our, our key interests were vehicles class four through eight. So those included all your medium duty vehicles, all your um, uh, delivery trucks and such, um, which are more kind of what you'd find within the urban urban center. Um, and then as well, your typical larger vehicles, your, we looked at buses, we looked at um, transit and school buses, refuse trucks, um, you know, everything that would have passed through, cement mixers, dump trucks, um, and then your typical uh, semi-tractor trailers. This was a collaborative project funded by a number of partners, all shown here, and the contractor for it was Envirotest Canada. They're the folks who currently run the air care program. So how does RSD work? This diagram is kind of a simplified, uh, um, depicts how this how the setup works. So first of all, we have a camera that's set up in the back, and that just takes a picture of the vehicle's license plate as it passes through. We want to match up the license plate to the database that we have from ICBC so that we have additional information on that vehicle. Its age, its weight, um, um, you know, ver its characteristics, other characteristics and such. Um, we have a speed and acceleration um, detector on the ground as well. The reason for this is that this equipment requires that the vehicle be in acceleration. Um, if the vehicle is braking or kind of coasting through, that those that data is not valid and it gets tossed out. So we need to know whether it's in positive acceleration. Um, and then finally, the RSD equipment itself comprises of a detector, an emitter and a detector. And the video actually, um, when you uh, log in to watch it, explains uh, very well how that equipment works and how basically it sends a beam across the road and um, reflects it back and whatever does not come back to the emitter um, was blocked basically by pollutants and that's how the absence of what of, of the beam that returned is how it records how much pollutant was in the plume. Now this diagram just shows a single low stack detector which works great for light duty vehicles and as well for um, buses and such which mostly have their tailpipes um, towards the ground but because we're looking at a mix of vehicles we needed to capture all the semi-tractor trailers and some of the larger vehicles that have their stacks elevated. So we had both a low stack and a high stack operating simultaneously. And finally, all that data feeds into a computer, which uh, then processes it. This is a, we have a couple of pictures, a couple of slides showing what it looks like in operation. And uh, there you can see our unit on the left there. And you see the sort of the elevated piece is the high stack tester. And as well on the ground, you can see the low, the low stack tester. And I think you can also kind of see the, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but you can see the camera there and as well the speed and accelerator, uh, acceleration detectors on the ground there. <coughs> Just another shot of uh, the equipment in operation. So this is what it looks like inside the trailer. Um, this is what the data collect collected looks like. You see the photo of the license plate. And then um, on the right-hand side, you, there's a, a bunch of information about the speed and acceleration and then all the pollutant readings on the right-hand side there. Cool. So inside the trailer as well, there were staff there to um, basically tag edit, and this is to note the uh, license plates um, as they pass through and those were manually entered um, most of the time manually manually entered so that it would we could then later match it with ICBC 
And it seems like a fairly automated process, um, but it actually did, it was actually probably more labor intensive than I expected, but there's definitely staff that are required to be on site at all times. And as well, set up and alignment of the equipment um, was fairly labor intensive. It took about an hour and a half um, each day um, for both high and low stacks, uh, the high and low emitters to be set up. So this is just another shot of what it looks like in, uh, in reality. Um, uh, part of sometimes staff are on hand to actually wave the vehicles through to try to get as many positive acceleration readings as we could. Um, part of the problem was when truckers, um, when truck drivers see uh, cones by the side of the road, they're pretty much trained to slow down, which is the exact opposite effect of what we wanted. So uh, sometimes staff are out there trying to wave them, encourage them uh, to go uh, to press on the gas. So. Testing locations, we had 24 sites throughout Metro Vancouver and the Fraser Valley Regional District. You can kind of see them um, scattered here. And these, these slides will be available after the fact. So if you wanted to have a look at these in more depth, you can kind of see where they were located. We selected test locations based on the number of criteria. First of all, they had to be safe. We wanted specifically certain types of truck. Uh, certain types of vehicles to be captured, so we located based on where we thought we would find those. Again, um, vehicles had to be in positive acceleration, so you know they had to be a slight incline ideally. Um, we couldn't use sites that were um, kind of on a downhill slope. And as well, we needed approval by the agency responsible, so municipalities or the province and such. In the end, the locations included four way scales, multiple roadside sites on and off ramps, a large intermodal yard, truck pullouts with, uh, where safety inspections were happening, truck brake check area, and four transit yards to capture some of the TransLink fleet. This is uh, an overview shot on ANASYS that shows what the setup looked like as the vehicles were um, passing through. And you can kind of see it's not, um, you know, it's not that obtrusive. Um, this is uh, the setup on, on an on-ramp. This is the the setup we had out at Nordell at the way station there, and this one's a little bit different. You can kind of see there's a tent in the middle, um, and there's a, a dump truck going through that. Um, this this was um, this was a safe. This is a way scale. So, and as well, I believe safety inspections were happening here, but some of the vehicles were being pulled in through the tunnel test, which I'll talk about next. And um, right after the tunnel, you can kind of see our trailer there. So we were doing a tunnel test and remote sensing RSD test simultaneously. So a bit about this tunnel test. Um, we had, uh, for one week, uh, we had a professor come up, uh, Dr. Stedman from Colorado, come up and, and try out a different type of equipment, which is um, a little bit different than remote sensing. Remote sensing basically takes a snapshot as the vehicles pass through the beams. Um, this the system has basically incorporates a tunnel which has an air intake on the top. You can kind of see on the top of the tunnel there's a pipe there uh, which has holes drilled through there. And as the vehicle passes through, um, a number of air intakes, the air, the holes um, take in the plume and then that gets sent down and gets analyzed inside the trailer, the Winnebago, on the side there. <clears throat> and as well, we had a remote sensing device set up um, right next to it so that we had uh, dual sets of data to kind of compare. One of the lessons we learned uh, through this tunnel test, there were a number of lessons, but one of them we learned was that not all trucks are um, regulation height, and I think this was on the first day, and the whole study almost got taken out, but uh, fortunately they were able to uh, salvage the tunnel and um, uh, get it back operational. Um, this is just a shot inside of the uh, infamous Dr. Stedman um, uh, looking at some of the data that is produced through the tunnel test. And then this is just a photo of the very last truck that we tested, and that was on October 9th of last year. <clears throat> so a bit about how this actually worked out. So timelines, we had very short, it was a very compressed project. We started talking about in April of 2012, and um, you know, within the next few months, we contracted EnviroTest. Um, they conducted training for operators and mobilized equipment. By July 19th, we started testing. Um, in August, the last week of August, we did the tunnel testing. 
And by October 9th, we had completed 55 days of testing. Uh, Record-breaking stretch of dry weather helped. Now, the reason for this is that this equipment, um, and that's one of the one of the limitations we learned about, is that this equipment does not operate uh, well, especially the low stack test um, on uh, rainy days. And seeing as we typically have a lot of rain, we considered ourselves pretty fortunate last year that we had a very dry September. And then by October 12th, the project was finished, and the trailer was heading back to Tucson, and um, and EnviroTest was busy analyzing the results. So by the numbers, again, 55 days of testing, we saw 11,700 tests on heavy-duty vehicles, 6,000 of which were unique um, vehicles. Basically, we saw about a fifth of the region's heavy-duty trucks throughout this, within those 55 days. So the types of vehicles we saw um, ranged in size, but primarily were the largest, the diesel class 8s. And this is largely because of where we chose to locate. Um, we mainly chose uh, chose areas where you know where larger vehicles tended to congregate. So that was partly part of the reason why um, we saw so many of those, and also partly because the smaller vehicles tend to be more scattered throughout the city, so it's harder to to capture a large uh, volume of them. <clears throat> where were they from? Most of them were from our region, uh, Lower Mainland. Uh, DEH means those are the codes within the ICBC database that matches to our geographic area. Um, we had, a, I at least had expected to see a bit more from uh, Washington and Alberta, and there actually weren't that many. Um, and then uh, a, a, a fair number were unmatched, where they had BC plates, but for one reason or another, we weren't able to match their plates with the ICBC database. So, what were the findings? First of all, um, nothing was particularly surprising. Everything made a lot of sense. One of the first uh, results that we found were that older vehicles are dirtier, and this just goes to show that federal emission standards are working. Um, we, thought, we saw that every time a new, uh, more stringent regulation kicked in, the, that model year, typically the model year afterwards, would show a drop, um, especially for particulate emissions. That was quite apparent. There's a little bit more of a lag in the NOx emissions. So, uh, yeah, older vehicles emit more. The 75% of vehicles, which were 2007 model, which is a, sort of a, a, uh, an important year in terms of regulations. That's when regulations became a lot more stringent. The 75% that were older than that model year contributed 98% of the diesel particulates and 90% of the NOx. So in terms of a policy direction, that might tell us that retiring or retrofitting older vehicles um, or in some ways, you know, getting older vehicles off the road may make a lot of sense. This is a chart that, this is a, for diesel particulate matter, and it just kind of shows you there's some of the results of what, what the um, end results look like. This red line is the approximate standard. Um, so over time, which is on the bottom axis, you can see um, the federal standards ramp down of what's the allowable emission levels. And again, you can see 2007, there's a, there's a big drop. And as well, there's an earlier drop back in 2000, it looks like. And the two results, we've got both tunnel results and RSD results shown on this diagram. Um, you can see there's a consistent um, RSD results for diesel particulate was consistently higher. Um, that's something that the researchers are still looking into, but it could have to do with the fact that the equipment that's being used in the RSD project um, is quite different than what's being used in the tunnel um, t test. The tunnel test actually analyzes the actual diesel particulates um, versus the remote sensing device um, uses opacity as a, as a proxy or as an estimate of diesel particulates. So there's something, uh, there's a bit of difference in the equipment and again that's something that we're looking into. But what is interesting is you can see that um, regardless of which, whether you're looking at purple or black, um, the drops in emissions are uh, correspond with the regulations fairly closely. This slide is NOx, and um, again, you can see the red line shows the em emissions standards as they drop over time. And from that, you can see uh, the actual readings for each year um, drop as well, but you can see a bit more of a lag, whether you're looking at the blue, which is the RSD, or the black, which is the tunnel. Uh, you, there's a bit more of a perceptible lag, and, and what's interesting is towards the uh, the last few years, when it gets very stringent for NOx, um, 
it looks like on average vehicles exceeded that. The other major finding we had was that in every age group there is this sort of dirtiest 10 percent or what we call the gross emitters. And what we found were the dirtiest 10 percent, for example, um, emitted four to five times more NOx and PM than the average, eight times more VOCs and 11 times more carbon monoxide. And there's a number of reasons why this could be happening. It could be um, failure of the emission control equipment, uh, it could be tampering, deliberate tampering, um, or just, you know, sort of deterioration or just poor, poor maintenance and such. So um, uh, in terms of policy direction, identifying these high emitters and targeting them for repairs uh, may make a lot of sense. And this diagram uh, came out of the study as well, and that this shows you, um, what this shows is all the model years along the bottom, and this is a diesel particulates. And then along the, I think it's the z-axis where you're going backwards, you've got the number one, which is the, um, the cleanest 10%, let's just say, and number 10 over there, which is the dirtiest 10%. So, we, you know, all the populations for each model year has been split into 10% deciles. And if you look at the sort of the purplish-pink bar, you can see that in every model year, regardless, that dirtiest um, portion of the fleet, the dirtiest 10%, and in some cases even the dirtiest 20% might be worth looking at, perhaps um, emits significantly more than, um, than the, you know, the 50th percentile, so the middle range, or and definitely much more than the, than the cleanest vehicles, even in the newest model years. So challenges we faced um, in this project, uh, first of all, I already mentioned that we can't test in the rain. Um, and as well, I also mentioned that this is only provides a snapshot of emissions as the vehicles pass through. We also worked on very tight, tight timelines. Um, the tunnel test was very interesting. We, um, uh, not only in terms of the setup, um, truck driver's reaction to this, this uh, driver responses to this project in general, both the truck test, the tunnel testing and the um, RSD testing uh, was very interesting. We um, had issues with uh, vehicles cruising through. Um, and sometimes it could have been a misunderstanding or response to seeing cones. Other times it could be deliberate um, for fear of, you know, having emissions show up as being um, high. Um, and as well, uh, avoidance. Uh, these uh, truckers are well connected in terms of using the radios to um, uh, warn each other. So that's, you know, it's a bit of hearsay. We don't know whether avoidance was happening, but that's something we, uh, uh, you know, definitely could have been possible that we didn't get as many readings as we could have. So what did we do after the study? So we've used this data and now this year we're working on, on conducting a multiple accounts approach to evaluating range of policy options. Now that we have an understanding of what the fleet look, looks like and some sort of policy direction based on what we've learned, um, let's look at all the range of policy and programs that we could be, could be considering. And that list there just shows um, some of the measures we are looking at. Um, we also are able to better target the population um, that we want to uh, focus on in terms of policy. Um, our contractor for this, this year's program is SNC-Lavalin and it's being guided by a number of partners, uh, many of which were, um, uh, more, all of which were involved with the remote sensing last year. So the current project where we're looking at policy options is looking to be complete by the end of this year. For more information, we have a report that we um, you can actually access the, um, the re uh, a report on remote sensing that uh, we have on our website. And here's the link to the video, which we were not able to play. And as well, feel free to contact um, any of us here listed if you have any questions. And at this point, I believe we have some, we don't have any questions, so I guess we can open it up for questions. So if there are any questions, now's the now's your opportunity to just type them in and we'll respond to them. Yes, don't shout it out. We can't yeah. hear you. <laughs> we can give you a couple of minutes for that. Okay, we've got one question here from um, from Louisa. Okay, did you measure ambient PM concentration at your sites? No, we didn't. Uh, the purpose of this study was specifically to uh, measure the concentrations coming out of the truck uh, emission stacks. So we were looking for emissions 
we were looking for emission readings from individual trucks uh, as opposed to finding out the concentration of, of PM in the ambient air near those testing sites. And we, we, we do recognize, of course, that air quality near near truck routes or, or along major roads is, is an issue as well. But this, this study was geared specifically at getting emission, emission test results for trucks uh, themselves. Um, any more questions out there? Not. Apparently you've done too good a job maybe, for anybody to question. Maybe we can just put up the, uh, the links again for, um, for the video. Sure. This presentation. Um, I believe the, the webinar itself are, is, has been recorded, so we'll be posting that online. And um, I think we can probably distribute, if, if anybody is interested in seeing the presentation, um, then we can, uh, we can distribute that as well. Oh, here we go, we do have another question. So the question is, you mentioned that diesel is responsible for two-thirds of the air quality cancer risk associated with air pollution. Do you mean outdoor air pollution or are you factoring radon and indoor air pollution into this? So <clears throat> that was a study that was uh, that looked at outdoor air pollution specifically and it looked at uh, it, was, it was for our region for the lower Fraser Valley, uh, Metro Vancouver and Fraser Valley and it looked at air quality concentrations um, it, from, from outdoor stations and, and it included a number of uh, toxic air contaminants and, and of those diesel PM, diesel exhaust was uh, was found to be responsible for two-thirds of that risk. But no, it, it didn't factor in um, indoor exposures which uh, which we also do recognize is another uh, another key consideration. But our, our study was limited to and, and along with our jurisdiction is limited to outdoor air pollution. So the next question we have here is, how would you identify the 10% gross emitters for policy implementation? Maybe I'll take a stab at this one. Um, they would have to be identified through um, some sort of uh, emissions testing. Um, you know, it, it's not something that, uh, be, you know, because again, it's scattered throughout all the age groups, all the model years. It's not a particular age. It's, it's the worst 10% in every year, so they would have to be tested somehow. Um, remote sensing is something that uh, could be considered um, as, a, as a way to screen, but yeah, there are a variety of options to screen for the dirtiest emitters. Is there anything to add to that? Um, no, it's, it's a great question, and it's one that we're, we're wrestling with at the moment in, in the follow-up study to look at the different options. And so you know, if, if we did want to identify those, the most direct means is, is to have some sort of an inspection program in place. Uh, the next question is, uh, <clears throat> have RSD studies of truck emissions been conducted in other Canadian cities? Um, not, that I, not to my knowledge. Um, I believe an RSD study of truck emissions was conducted in Mexico, um, but I don't believe any other Canadian cities have uh, looked specifically at trucks, definitely at light-duty vehicles, um, but not at the heavy duties. I know our consultant is online, so if you know of other cities, just type it in there. But uh, I, I believe that's I believe he was right there. I think that's it. Are there? Does anyone have any other questions? Oh, there we got one. Um, I'll ask you can answer it. When you okay. speak about diesel PM that you measured, are you referring to a particular size fraction of PM? I'm not familiar with the techniques you used. Mm. Uh, good question. And as Eve mentioned, the um, the remote sensing actually measures opacity. So, uh, and, and then there's a conversion that uh, that converts that reading to an actual uh, concentration of particulate matter. So, um, I would I would think it's just more the uh, the most of the PM fraction that's included in that uh, you know, that is a part of that opacity reading. Uh, that said, um, the prime the most of the exhaust, most of the PM coming from diesel engines is in the 2.5 size fraction anyways. 
uh, or smaller. So we're when you're talking about diesel PM, it's primarily PM 2.5. So the next question is, I noticed that many measurements were taken outside and not within the tunnel. Was such outdoor testing limited to non-wind periods? Um, again, uh, Ed, feel free to chime in. Um, but I understand that um, it can, uh, as long as the um, weather is not extreme, it can operate you know, in, in situations where there's light winds, um, as long as there's no, no rain. And I understand the reason for the rain is because um, especially the spray from the ground as the vehicle passes through tends to obstruct the readings. Um, so I don't know that wind is, a, is that much of a concern. Um, but again, if you know any more details, Ed, feel free to correct me on that. A um, couple of comments. There's another question here. Was it possible to identify vehicles retrofitted with an after-treatment device? If so, how did their emissions compare with newer model years equipped with after-treatment devices or same model year vehicles without retrofit? That's a really good question. Uh, not specifically. Um, we, we did have access to the, to the information associated with those vehicles from the ICBC, our, our insurance database, so we could identify the model year and the type of truck that it was, but that doesn't, it's not accompanied with uh, information on after treatment devices. So, um, unfortunately, not specifically, and you know, we would expect, of course, that the emissions from those devices that might have those retro, or from those vehicles that might have those retrofits, would be lower. But, but we weren't able to, um, we weren't able to associate that. And that said, again, um, if we, if, a, if we know a vehicle went through, um, through one of our test sites that. We did have a retrofit installed, and we, were, we did have the capability to look up its, its uh, license plate and see how the, how the emissions tested, but that wasn't a, a specific focus of our study. So the next question is, can this technology be used for marine emissions? And I believe it can, um, and I actually feel like we saw an example of it where it was being used, and I feel like it actually was under a bridge of some sort. Yeah. Um, Again, if Ed wants to jump in with this, um, but I believe it can. In terms of the principle of it, um, it, it should work as long as it has an emissions plume. Um, it, it should be able to capture it as long as there's nothing obstructing. Um, and if you can position it in a, such a place where you can capture that plume, um, I don't see why not. It's just a, maybe a matter of, you know, sort of practically can you set it up in a way, um, given that ship emissions tend to, I, I don't know how consistently emitted they are, um, there may actually be better technologies for marine um, that may be more suitable. Yeah, I think the only thing I have to add is I, I think I've seen uh, examples of it used for rail as well. So I think there are other applications. Um, you know, obviously, it, it works well for an on-road uh, testing situation, uh, but uh, that, that might be a question for the vendor about other applications. Next question is, the graph showing the years of progress in pollution reduction related to industry standards appear to reflect that present day standards are not being met. Um, have we met the bar on what can be achieved? So, uh, I mean, I would, we do, in our report it does caution um, against comparing the test results directly to that emission standard line because the the test that is used to determine whether emission is meeting uh, its engine standards is a different test, and so we do have to recognize in, in this test, especially with the remote sensing, that it's just it's a snapshot of the emissions for that you know, that second or that fraction of a second that the vehicle passes through the through the test location. So uh, comparing the results from the remote sensing to, to the emission standard testing isn't, isn't quite an apples and orange comparison. And so what we were hoping to see was that, you know, was it at least close to the standards and was it tracking the standards? And, and the answer to that was yes. Um, but I don't know if we would necessarily make the conclusion that um, for, for a vehicle where, it's, where the emissions are close to the standard, we, I don't know if we would say that it was uh, in violation of that standard. Mm -hmm. We have an explanation from um, our contractor about the wind question. He says, um, uh, and this is the question about whether wind, uh, whether we could operate the equipment in heavy wind. He said, as for wind, the testing with remote RSD is conducted using ratios of emissions related to the CO2 from the vehicle. The wind 
impacts on all the emissions equally. So in other words, um, the CO2 would be affected by the wind at the same, you know, in the same movement and at the same rate as all the other pollutants, so therefore you can still operate it in, in windy conditions. And as far as the question on uh, marine testing, there's a comment that the contractor has done marine testing on the Staten Island Ferry, and that was done by mounting equipment on the boat itself. And, and then one more from Ed um, regarding whether this has been done elsewhere. We have conducted um, RSD testing on heavy trucks at the U.S.-Mexico border um, in other countries and this year in Maryland. And I believe there were some, uh, it was used as well on bus fleets as well in uh, somewhere in the U.S., I think New Jersey or something. That was additional experience there. We have another question. Sorry, it's a really small window, so we should try and read your names, but it's in about eight millimeters of space. Are new diesel engines using some form of catalytic converter or are the new diesel engines primarily using injector technology only? Well, the, um, I'll, I'll start and you can comment if you have anything to add, but uh, I mean, primarily what, what we were looking for at least was, was a focus on, on diesel PM and so the, the newer engines are definitely using newer technology and you can see that if you, know, if you recall the the chart that compared the emission standard line, that, that red line, you could see it uh, <coughs> ramping down over time. And so from, from 2007, for example, there's, there's new technology on, on the diesel trucks with the, with the diesel particulate filter. And so that was, that was something that, we, that showed up really well. You could see for, that, for, that, for those newer model years of trucks that uh, the technology was, uh, was doing the job that it was intended to do. Um, I don't have anything to add to that, so I'll move on to the next one. How long do uh, diesel particulates remain suspended in the air? Or how long do diesel particulates remain suspended in the air? Is it possible that emitted plumes may re remain suspended and resampled with following vehicles? That's a good question. That, I'm that, that is a good question. Um, but I, I, I don't think that is, I mean, I, I can't answer that. Uh, um, Unequivocally, but unequivocally, but I, I, I don't think that's uh, an issue with this. They do um, small particles um, tend to take a, a little bit longer to to settle out, but uh, and maybe the, our contractor can comment on how the um, readings might change between vehicles. But uh, it really is. If, if you look at the setup, the exhaust plume is is right there at um, at the reading height where the where the where the beams pass through the exhaust, so it's a it's a fairly direct reading. And we have a response from our contractor about um, additional testing locations. We performed RSD testing on the Boston Transit fleet uh, on a continuous basis. Daily results help them identify emissions failures immediately. Thanks, Ed, for the clarification on that. Um, and another comment from Ed. Um, we compare the emission, particulate emissions from each vehicle in the background before and after the truck passes the equipment. There, there you go. So that's how we control for that. Any last questions? I think all is quiet. I think. Oh, there's one more. Still time. Uh, keep yeah. them coming. <laughs> uh, could a lot of the emissions reductions from 2007 be related to fuel improvement, less sulfur, or did that come in prior to 2007? Um, it's a combination of both, um, really, because the, the, the lower sulfur fuel <clears throat> for diesel fuels was um, was a required. It was necessary in order for the the emission technology to work, and so if, if higher sulfur fuel would have if that was all that was available, it would poison the, the emission control technology. So it, it really is a combination. Um, so it's, it's attributable, to, attributable to both, I would say. And I believe that that regulation did come in before 2007 yes, I, in order to ensure that there would be contamination. Right. Yeah, I, I can't remember the exact year, but 2006 or five or thereabouts. Any last questions? We have still 20 minutes. <laughs> Dead silence? <laughs> I think we've exhausted all the questions. Oh, okay, hold on. Go. One more. How efficient is the exhaust filters on the diesel trucks, and do they plug up? 
require maintenance or do truckers remove them? I'll, I'll answer this one. Um, when operating in ideal conditions, they actually are um, quite efficient, as you can see from the you know the standards. They they drop emissions down to I think like one or two percent of um, what the particulates would have. Now they do plug up. So one of the things that are required is um, high high speed travel on um, highways is one of the ways that you know, you, you create enough heat or is it, I don't know if it's pressure or heat to basically blast um, the anything that's in there um, out. Now, in cases where you don't have that as part of your driving cycle, like it, for example, if you are a transit vehicle or a um, refuse hauler, they do tend to have issues with um, clogging up. So built into the systems are kind of what they call regeneration. And what they do is they use fuel and actually um, create that pressure or temperature to basically clear these out. Um, so that, that's how these diesel particulate filters typically operate. And in terms of uh, maintenance... Well, if there is a maintenance <laughs> schedule that is associated with those. And, uh, but at the same time, there is, there's a warranty that comes along with that. And so the, the final part of that question was, uh, do truckers remove them? And that's, you know, anecdotally, that is something that is of concern to us because we do hear about tampering as an issue in, in the truck industry. It's, uh, I think, uh, I mean, primarily given looking at our emission results, especially for the newer model year trucks, it, it, it illustrated that their, their emissions are clean, so it doesn't indicate that there's any kind of tampering, and it, it also indicates that the technology is continuing to work. But that said, we did hear from some truckers who you know, would comment offhand that once their warranty was out, then uh, they may consider removing some of their some of their equipment. It, it, uh, there is a slight fuel efficiency penalty that comes along with um, with some of the emission controls, and uh, so that's uh, sort of an incentive for them to potentially remove that. So, in our work now to look at what kind of options we can put in place, that's uh, tampering is one of the concerns, and how do we prevent that? And there's there's legislation in place for that, but uh, enforcement is a, is definitely an issue there. That's definitely an issue that both um, uh, U.S. and Canadian governments and at all levels are concerned with. Um, uh, we have anecdotally seen uh, evidence of companies that are offering kits to kind of assist with hollowing out uh, some of these devices so that on a visual inspection you actually can't even tell that um, they're actually no longer operational. Um, so that's definitely a concern. A couple more questions rolling in. Question, can you give us an estimate of the cost of the project? We can. Um, I believe it was 150. Yeah, uh, the budget was in the neighborhood of 150 thousand dollars. Is the Vancouver, BC heavy duty fleet comparable in age with other Canadian uh, regions and provinces? Uh, just going on my gut instinct, I would say it's, it's probably close, but I actually I, I haven't done that comparison to, to say for sure. Mm -hmm. is, it, oh, is it possible for you to give us an idea of how much the sampling costs? There I think that was, yeah. that was that question. Any more questions? Last chance. <laughs> You have our contact information, so if you do have follow-up questions, feel free to contact Eve or me, and, and we'll be happy to respond. Thank you very much.